Okay. Hello and welcome to today's IoT Analytics webinar. Um, first off, I'd like to thank you all for joining. I hope you're, you're going to enjoy today's presentation and gain some new insights into one of the hot topics we're currently covering at the moment, and that is industrial IoT cellular connectivity. And in this webinar, we'll be discussing the main deployment challenges, solutions, and trends around that. Uh, before we start, I just want to do some basic housekeeping. So please note all attendees are muted throughout the presentation, but at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box where you can write any questions at the end of the presentation. Should you have any uh, issues throughout the webinar, please, um, so hearing us or viewing us, um, please let us know in the chat box and we'll do our best to help you out. Um, okay, so um, my name is, is Podrick Scully. I'm the Chief Research Officer here at IoT Analytics. I lead the team of market analysts here, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Um, to outline today's agenda, uh, for the next 60 minutes or so, we'll begin with a brief introduction to IoT Analytics and today's speakers. Then part two will cover the evolving IoT connectivity landscape in general, followed by part three, which will dive down into use cases, trends, and challenges of industrial connectivity. Part four will expand on end-to-end -end device to cloud IoT solutions, and part five will cover industrial transformation and business model innovation. Finally, we'll, we'll round off the webinar with a, with a Q&A session to answer any of your, your questions provided in the Q&A box. Um, okay, so to, to start off with the, the introduction, um, we're, I'll give you a quick intro into IoT analytics and what we do. So essentially we are a, a niche market analyst firm solely focusing on providing research and insights for the Internet of Things. We essentially have two business lines. The first is offering detailed market reports. And the second is offering bespoke customer research services and consulting. So we, we cover six main work streams focusing on IoT software platforms, industrial IoT, IoT connectivity, smart city, as well as emerging technology and other general areas. Our headquarters uh, is in Germany, but we operate globally and we serve over 400 customers with our research services. We've recently published reports on low power wide area network and in industry 4.0. Um, and we have a steady pipeline of reports for the, for the coming months, such as reports on 5G and predictive maintenance. So we have a great lineup for today's speakers. Two from IoT Analytics, Eugenio Pascal, our principal analyst for IoT connectivity and Matt Wapata, our Senior Analyst for Industrial IoT and Industry 4.0. Um, we're also delighted to be joined by two industry experts from Sierra Wireless, Clark Smith, who is the Product Manager for IoT Services, and Remy Marco Torcino, the Director of Marketing for Industrial IoT Solutions at Sierra. So thanks to all of you for, for being here today. I look, I look forward to your, your presentations. Okay, that, that's enough from me. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Eugenio for his take on the evolving IoT connectivity landscape. Yeah, thank you, Paul Rick. So I think the best way to start is uh, with uh, some examples of uh, successful IoT projects today. And uh, there's plenty to choose from, uh, all with their own uh, connectivity challenges and connectivity solutions. A few examples here from the left, we have the uh, connected elevator from a distant group. Uh, they're using um, uh, 3G, 4G connectivity uh, for predictive maintenance purposes, basically uh, using a 3G, 4G modem connected to their own uh, elevators control system to send data to the cloud. And they have about 150 thousand uh, connected elevators today. This is a very interesting example. Or uh, the uh, smart port uh, in Hamburg uh, where they have uh, implemented about 20 projects uh, for um, uh, logistics uh, kind of use cases where they're using IoT for uh, 
managing the traffic flow in the harbor, both in terms of trucks, um, vessels, uh, for shipment schedule and for the management of warehouses. And also here they're using like different combination of connectivity, including cellular. Another great example is a smart energy, in particular smart metering, one of the most mature use cases today. Um, the number of uh, connected meters today is uh, well, uh, beyond uh, uh, hundreds of millions of, uh, uh, of deployments. Just hydron, I think they have like around that, uh, that number. And the connectivity options here are like um, plenty. Um, cellular, LP1, mesh networks, and so on. So these are just some of the examples here, which show you how um, complex and how big is the IoT connectivity landscape today. And uh, uh, in here, I'm going to show you basically how we have decided to um, uh, to segment these uh, connectivity uh, solutions that we have for IoT today. On the bottom left, we have basically a short range, low performance connectivity solution, the various uh, uh, personal area network technologies like ZigBee, Z-Wave, or some industrial wireless connectivity uh, protocols like Wireless Art and MBUS. Uh, on the top uh, left, uh, we have a more general purpose protocols, which uh, uh, are uh, familiar for uh, most consumers because of uh, smart of uh, you know Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. We use them in our smartphones in many of our personal <coughs> devices. But these have been uh, increasingly uh, implemented with new uh, IoT features and are being uh, uh, announced for IoT more and more. Uh, we have uh, on the bottom right uh, also low power area uh, technologies or in general uh, long range and low performance technologies. Low power with their networks like LoRa, Sixforce and the IoT are just the new arrivals within this uh, sector which are designed to specifically target IoT uh, use cases. And on the top right we have, uh, uh, sorry, we have uh, long range and high performance connectivity technologies, basically our classical cellular technologies and satellites, which are not designed for IoT, but uh, they are often used in IoT solutions because of their uh, network coverage, their ubiquity. Uh, so um, today, as we mentioned, we are going to focus on cellular technologies, basically traditional cellular and uh, what we call the LP1 license technologies, LTM and MDIoT. Looking at the old picture now, so how are these protocols being used in IoT? And this chart is showing exactly that. So this represents the number of IoT connections um, uh, that are active uh, today in 2019 and our estimates for the next seven years until 2025. So what should catch your eye here? are mainly two things. Number one, that low power weather networks are going to be the fastest growing connectivity technologies over the course of the next six years, both unlicensed, but especially licensed. So those cellular LP1, in particular NDIoT, are gonna grow with 80% uh, uh, annual growth per year until 2025. And then the second factor, we can see that cellular IoT in general, which is the blue and light blue part, uh, represent uh, uh, maybe a small part of the all IoT today, but it's, go it's growing faster than on cellular and it's going to play a major and major role in the future, thanks uh, from one side uh, to the growth of these uh, uh, cellular uh, low power weather network technologies, and in the mid uh, um, long term, let's call it, also with the emergence of 5G for IoT. So talking about these two technologies, um, in this slide, I want to provide some proof points about the incredible growth that low power weather area networks are having. Uh, we recently published a report on this subject where we found out that uh, basically low power weather area networks in the unlicensed spectrum, so I'm talking about LoRa and Sixfox in particular today, uh, still have uh, an early market lead, but uh, MBIoT and in a manner of way um, LPM are growing much faster and will take over the leadership from this too. 
And we believe that by 2023, two out of three IP1 connections will be based on cellular low power weather networks. Concerning 5G, so 5G is considered is potentially a game changer for IoT, but despite what uh, you may have heard, uh, it's going to take a while, especially for IoT. And the reason is that uh, uh, this uh, initial deployment of 5G are being focused on non-IoT scenarios, specifically the enhanced mobile broadband and uh, the uh, fixed wireless access scenarios. Matter of fact, the first release for 5G, release 15, uh, is only focused on uh, these uh, two scenarios. And we're going to have to wait release uh, 16, which is accept, expected sometime in 2020, uh, to have uh, operators able uh, to start deploying network that could address uh, critical IoT and massive IoT scenarios. And we believe that this won't happen before 2021, 2022, at the, at the earliest. In the meanwhile, NBIOT and LTM will evolve as part of the 5G standards and will uh, address the uh, massive IoT scenario. Let me conclude by saying what's the role of 5G in the industrial IoT? On the right, we have like four um, application scenarios here. So as we can see, this is very varied because we have critical IoT applications like mobile robots uh, or process automation with closed loop control, which require ultra low latency and high reliability. We have uh, um, intra-site logistic applications, uh, which include also uh, automatic guided vehicles, the tracking of uh, uh, deliveries uh, of shipments uh, and the trucks, uh, but also like inventory management, uh, which are mostly like massive IoT kind of scenarios, especially the latest, but also enhanced mobile broadband um, applications like uh, augmented reality used to enhance uh, the role of workers to allow them to have uh, uh, remote maintenance uh, or uh, diagnosis for uh, different things. So 5G is going to have a big role in industrial IoT, but that's going to take a while. That's my final statement, and now I will pass the word back to uh, Podrick. Great. Thanks, thanks, Eugenia. Really interesting content from your, your, your latest research, and uh, we're looking forward to your report on, on 5G, which we'll discuss that in, in more detail. Um, if anyone has any questions uh, at this point, please write them in the Q&A box uh, again, and uh, we'll address those at, at the end of the presentation. Okay, uh, next up is Matt Wapata, who is going to talk to us about use cases trends and challenges of industrial connectivity. Um, so yeah, over, over to you, Matt. So. Okay, so. Um, so maybe start again, Matt. Uh, so, oh, and I was talking to myself for a second. Yeah, yeah can you yeah, hear me yeah. now, Patrick? Yeah, go. Cool. Okay, great. So thanks for the handoff. The uh, first thing that I'm going to discuss is the 12 key Industry 4.0 use cases that we identified in a recent Industry 4.0 and Smart Manufacturing Report that we published. And uh, these 12 use cases um, does not cover the entire spectrum of industry 4.0 use cases, but it is um, a selection of the 12 largest and fastest growing use cases. And within these 12, four use cases in particular have a very strong um, use of cellular connectivity technology. And we're going to take a deeper dive into these four use cases, the everything as a service business models, predictive maintenance, data-driven asset, plant performance optimization, and remote service. So on the left side of this slide, you can see all 12 of the use cases that were shown on the previous slide. And seven out of 12 of the use cases have a strong or occasional role of, of using cellular connectivity. And the four that have a strong role are, like I stated before, the performance optimization, predictive maintenance, remote service, and everything as a service business models. And on the right side of the screen, we highlight four specific case studies that are implementing cellular connectivity to achieve some of these industry 4.0 use cases. So 
the data-driven asset plant performance optimization use case study we've selected is from Atlas Copco, who uh, reduces downtime and improves performance of its industrial compressors using cellular connectivity. For predictive maintenance, uh, Eugenio actually referred to uh, Tyson Krupp in his presentation, but they also use cellular connectivity for connecting their elevators to their max predictive maintenance system, which um, reduces costs and improves customer experience. The remote service use case, uh, the case study that we've decided to show here is this company called Nakayama Ironworks, and it uses industrial cellular connectivity to reduce the service costs by remotely accessing their rock crushers at customer locations using cellular. And Equipment Share is a company that um, uses cellular connectivity to offer heavy equipment as a service, and it also tracks the assets that are, are being rented on its platform. So with that, let's, we're gonna take a deeper dive into the architectures that are used to achieve this connectivity. And the architectures can be broken down into two different categories. So one category is remote access, and these architectures provide on-demand or intermittent connectivity to the remote, to the remote assets. And the Nakayama Ironworks use case is an example of this, where the uh, cellular modem is used to remotely connect to the assets in the field, which reduces the cost of truck rolls if you had to go out and update all of the controllers on their machines. And it also helps with field service travel and reduces the cost associated with field, field service travel when a remote field service expert can log into the machine when there's an issue and, and troubleshoot it for the uh, customer. The other type of connectivity architecture is remote data collection. And these architectures have rely on permanent cellular connectivity to continuously collect data from the remote assets. And this type of architecture is used for use cases where data is required to improve operations. So reducing downtime, increasing asset utilization, and offering new as a service business models. And the elevator example, the equipment sharing example, and the remote data collection on the compressor are all three types of uh, use cases that use this remote data collection architecture. And now we'll take a deeper dive into both of these types of architectures to see how they're deployed and uh, some of the challenges that are associated with those deployments. So the first one we're gonna look at is remote access. And this is the, uh, again, the example of the uh, Nakayama uh, Iron Company where they have a cellular gateway out connected to their asset controller and there's a VPN connection going over the cloud where a remote field service expert or a customer service connection can log in on demand and um, troubleshoot the asset when there's an issue or remotely update the asset if there's um, a need to, to update the control system on, on the uh, asset on the field. And like I said, this is a on-demand connectivity architecture. And the value proposition, like we kind of stated before, is it lowers the cost associated with field service travel and um, it, you can also increase your revenue by having higher value service level agreements for your customers that um, want to have quick response times for service calls. There are a number of challenges associated with ar this architecture. Um, one being the uh, proprietary controller software that's sometimes required to go access the data on the controller. So the VPN client that you're using will need to be equipped with the correct software in order to collect the data from the asset. The intermittent nature of the connectivity also limits some of the other use cases that we'll highlight in the uh, remote data collection architectures. And device management, scalability, and security um, are all three challenges and pain points that are shared between the two architectures. But we'll quickly to discuss what those entail, Device management, also known as like updating the firmware on the cellular gateways and then onboarding new gateways and controllers. Scalability refers to the issue associated with taking your uh, industrial cellular network from one or two different locations to a global deployment where you have to manage the uh, uh, cellular connectivity in the US and Germany and, and Asia, so making sure that you have global agreements that span uh, more than one continent. And then security is obviously a, a uh, important feature in any connectivity uh, architecture, especially those relying on cellular. You have to 
that depend on data encryption, user authentication, and authorization. So that's the remote access type of architecture. And now we'll look at the remote data collection architecture. And this slide highlights four different types of remote data collection. And um, this differs, again, from the remote uh, access connect connectivity architecture because it is a permanent connection to apps and databases in the cloud where data is sent from the asset and stored in the cloud and then accessed remotely. So the first architecture highlights a cellular gateway connected to an asset controller, which pushes the data from the asset controller to the cloud. And this is a very popular architecture, especially for brownfield installations where there's equipment already out in the field and you need to put a gateway on it to uh, enable some connectivity. The second architecture highlights a uh, modern industrial controller that may have native cellular connectivity. The third architecture again uses a gateway, but instead of connecting to the controller, it connects directly to sensors and actuators. So it's more of a remote monitoring than a remote control architecture. And finally, the fourth architecture is for sensors that have cellular connectivity natively built into them. And this is becoming more popular as protocols like the LPWAM protocols that Eugenio highlighted are reducing the cost associated with adding connectivity to end devices. And uh, the three use cases, again, that fall under this type of category are the everything as a service, predictive maintenance, and data-driven asset optimization. Some unique challenges and pain points associated with the remote data collection architectures are first, edge protocol conversion. So since data is actually being sent to the cloud, the gateways or the controllers themselves have to convert the OT protocols like CAN bus or Modbus or OPC UA into IT protocols like JSON sent over HTTP or MQTT. The next challenge or pain point is data management. As uh, since cellular plans are typically based on a, are charged on a per megabyte basis, edge gateways and controllers need to efficiently send the data to the cloud. So Data management involves compressing, filtering, and um, formatting the data prior to sending it to the cloud so that it is a um, bandwidth efficient way of getting data to the cloud and, and uh, can reduce the cost associated with the sending the data. Edge application management refers to the um, analytics and visualization that's more and more being run on the edge devices. Um, as new technologies like virtualization and Docker containers and Kubernetes become more popular and edge devices and gateways become more, uh, have more computational power, more and more processing is going to be moved to the edge. And so managing the applications that are running on the edge is uh, emerging as a, a major challenge for these remote deployments over cellular. Certifying hardware is something that uh, often gets overlooked by companies where if you want to have your um, sensor certified on AT&T in the United States or Deutsche Telekom in uh, Europe, you have to get certifications with each provider. And so that can be an expensive and time consuming process if you're developing a new product. And then cellular carrier management is also an issue associated with the remote data collection architectures. Um, negotiating uh, Pricing with the different cellular carriers across different geographies and making sure that the, uh, the uh, cellular protocol that you're using is supported throughout the lifespan of your product. One pro problem that a lot of companies faced during um, the cellular protocols of 2G and 3G were the sunsetting of 3G and the sunsetting of 2G. They had to do a lot of truck rolls out to the, all of their devices that were connected to their networks because um, the Telcos in the United States uh, turned off those um, uh, those those bands over time. So that's a, something else that needs to be managed. And we already touched on device management, scalability, and security on the uh, remote access side. So in summary, there's two main types of connectivity architectures. The remote access remote access architectures on the left have some unique challenges, and the remote data collection architectures on the right have some unique challenges. But shared challenges through both of these architectures include device management, scalability, and security. So with that, I will pass it back over to Patrick. Great. Thanks, Matt. That's uh, some, some great uh, content as well sh shared from your, your latest research. Um, so 
Yeah, I suppose what I want to do now is, is just quickly give a summary of the presented insights. So what we've learned so far, IoT connectivity landscape is, is, is very complex and it's, it's continually evolving. Um, cellular is, is obviously important for many use cases and its potential to play a, an even bigger role. Uh, licensed low power wide area network and 5G is driving growth for cellular connectivity. Um, Cellular connectivity plays a strong role in, in most of the use cases. Uh, remote access and remote data collection are, are the two main types of use cases for industrial connectivity. Um, and as Matt said, shared challenges include device management, security, and, and scalability. Um, so, yeah, so now uh, I think I would like to hand it over to Clark. Uh, Smith, who is the product manager of IoT services at Sierra. Um, so, Clark, you, if I can just unmute you. Good morning. I think. I yeah, went, we're good. Went, yeah, went, I can hear you. Went, went one slide too far. Or okay, just get the slides to do what we need them to do. There we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's been a pleasure to listen to this information um, from the previous speakers, and they really have laid out very well what the um, what the issues are with IoT. And one thing that we can kind of sum it all up as is that industrial IoT offers an amazing opportunity um, for virtually every type of company out there, but it's hard. IoT can be very difficult, and you know the vast majority of projects that get started, up to 75% of them, actually end up taking at least twice as long as they had originally planned, just because they didn't anticipate some of the complexity that was really involved. And some of that complexity um, really is highlighted here in these challenges. I mean, IoT deployments by their very nature are difficult. Um, there are a lot of uh, security concerns, um, particularly in, in heavily uh, regulated uh, industries, you know, things like healthcare and some others. Um, and there's not a, always a, a really uh, solid um, base of, of knowledge, um, uh, IoT specific knowledge and analytical skills that are available to companies that are looking to branch out and leverage IoT to enhance their business. And the IoT ecosystem, as Matt laid out, is pretty complex. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of relationships that have to be established, and it can make things um, really challenging to, um, to carry out. Some of the drivers that, that that we see when we're talking about you know why companies are even looking to do IoT. IoT is a nice buzzword, but you know the companies are really trying to see if they can make uh, the devices and the and the services that they have more intelligent and gather more information from them in order to be able to provide better service and better products to their customers. They want to do things like improve operational efficiency. They want the outcomes for the customers to improve. Uh, and they may be looking at brand new business model or improving existing models and looking at ways to actually uh, increase, you know, or create new revenue streams from those IoT deployments. So there are a lot of good goals. And it's important that we, that we kind of keep that in, in mind as we, as we figure out how we can solve um, that those those challenges and actually uh, meet those those drivers that they're they're really um, that are driving the desire of these companies to um, 
uh, to venture out into IoT. Sorry, there's a little delay on the, there we go, oops. Um, so, uh, Sarah Wireless, uh, yeah, we, we really are in a, in a unique position. Uh, when you look at that whole infrastructure that, that Matt laid out, we are really looking at, at the complete ecosystem from an IoT perspective at Sarah Wireless. Uh, we really have that concept of you know, from the device to the cloud and everything in between, which is what you see here. Uh, Matt indicated some of the different uh, ways that uh, IoT is deployed. Um, sometimes it's you know through gateways that are that sensors are connecting to gateways and pushing information out to the edge. Uh, sometimes you know, and you're seeing this more and more. You have individual devices at the edge that are cellular enabled and have uh, actual IoT modules built into them and cellular connectivity, and you know. These are areas that, that uh, are, are very strong for Sierra Wireless, and we have been in this business for a long time and understand all the complexities of, of you know, devices that sit at the edge and gateways that have to carry information from the edge out to the cloud. But we also are a carrier. We are a global MVNO, and we offer global connectivity uh, that can simplify a lot of the deployments because of some of the things that uh, Matt mentioned, like you know, cellular carrier management. You know, if you're trying to deploy a, a solution across the globe or even in a particular region with several countries, uh, it can be very daunting to try and think about going to individual carriers and figuring out how to make your device work and connect in each of these countries. And we have that all taken care of with a single SIM and a single um, connection that will allow you to deploy a solution really anywhere on the globe. And then what's very important is being able to manage that fleet of, uh, uh, manage that fleet and you can do that through a, an IoT platform like we have in AirVantage. And we're gonna talk a little bit about more about that. But that's a single place where you can actually manage both the connectivity aspect of your IoT deployment as well as the devices that, that are working within your IoT deployment. And what we've done is really designed everything from, uh, from the ground up for IoT. Um, you know, the connectivity aspect of what we can do um, is really just core to being able to deliver IoT services. And the global coverage, that single point of management, having a wide choice of networks across the globe with a whole you know, range of flexible pricing to meet different business models, and actually bringing in professional services for companies that may not have that expertise um, in, in IoT. We can bring all that together and, and actually help companies uh, deploy, design and deploy a, uh, a, a uh, very complex and sophisticated and, uh, and very beneficial IoT deployment. Excuse me. And it's interesting because we, and I think you got a good sense of this, uh, the way Matt was laying this out is that, that there are really just a wide range of use cases out there. Um, there's such a wide range. You have some uh, devices that need, you know, 10, 10 years of battery life. You have others where it's remote cameras, you know, constantly, you know, sending traffic uh, or images of, of traffic and things like that. Um, such a wide range of, of connectivity um, requirements means that you have to have a whole range of connectivity options to meet, meet each one of those. And what Sierra has done is, is really looked at the market and made sure that we can address virtually every type of 
um, uh, IoT option to meet the IoT goals of the customers in the market. Um, our smart SIM and, and easy SIM are those global um, are those global SIMs that that can work virtually anywhere in the world. You can have a single uh, part number, a single SKU, a single SIM. So when you go to manufacture and you or you get your devices ready to deploy, you can put one SIM in uh, in the devices and deploy it anywhere in the world and and have it work. Um, we also have uh, our ready to connect solution, which uh, we're going to talk about in in just a moment. But even that solution, where we've taken the assets of our modules and our gateways and combine them with our connectivity so that when you have uh, you you actually engineer one of our modules into your new device it already has a SIM already embedded into it uh, an, an eSIM it's not even a physical SIM card um, it's an eSIM that allows it to be uh, to, you know uh, very small and in the module in the device deploy that device you can get connectivity out of the box wherever that device lands. Same is true of our gateways. Um, so that's a really exciting way to for companies that are looking to deploy new solutions to really shorten that time to market to get IoT solutions out. Our classic SIM uh, is, uh, particularly for the US, allows us to actually leverage uh, the big carriers and, and, and provide their SIMs to our customers because oftentimes we have customers that have designed uh, devices that are particular to a particular carrier. So maybe AT&T or Verizon. Uh, we actually can provide uh, those SIMs directly to our customers and give them full management of those SIMs through our IoT platform, the same way we do with our smart SIM and our easy SIM. In fact, if we have a customer that actually has some uh, SIMs deployed already out there that they had done directly with individual carriers, mm -hmm. and they want to start using, for example, our smart SIM, we say, come on, we can, we can uh, even bring your legacy operator SIMs, bring those into our AirVantage IoT platform, and you can manage all of your SIM and connectivity together along with the devices that you may have gotten from us as well. So, it, it's really making sure, and this is important when you're looking at, at uh, connectivity. Does the provider you're going to look at have all this full spectrum of, um, uh, of IoT options when it comes to connectivity? Um, I mentioned the single point of management, which simplifies all the operations. Uh, this allows you to do device management, SIM management, and, and managing the uh, the data flow from the device to the cloud. We also have professional services, as I mentioned, that's going to allow you to actually design and deploy your services efficiently. And we've really looked at how we can future-proof um, your connectivity so that as you're deploying this, you won't run into these kinds of issues like uh, so many people have, as was mentioned earlier, in the 2G and 3G sunsets. You know, we have uh, EUICC enabled smart SIMs, which means that uh, uh, you can actually remotely provision uh, those SIMs and allow, you know, new profiles and, and, and to be uh, put on those SIMs that are out in those devices so you can upgrade those SIMs and ensure that you don't have to have those truck rolls later on when you're, when you're trying to um, deploy to a new uh, or, or upgrade to a new service that might be coming out or a new technology. So that was a whole lot in a very short amount of time and a lot about connectivity, but I do want to encourage you to take a look at sierrawireless.com slash resources because we have a whole bunch of information on, uh, on connectivity and how to how to uh, wrap connectivity into your IoT deployment in a meaningful way and take some of the complexity out of it. And from there, I'll take, uh, send it back to Patrick.
can you hear me now so um thank you uh thank you uh clark um and uh, now i will showcase a bit uh, what we uh, we can achieve uh, uh with reliable connectivity in the uh, in the industry space um with some example of use cases and customer also i will look at some uh, opportunities uh to break some of these uh, challenges that we have uh, noticed and barriers uh, that companies are facing when they, they start to deploy uh, IoT. Also ways uh, as well uh, how company can optimize their TCO or total cost of ownership, uh, starting by having a good crap of their uh, grasp of their data profile and, uh, and also look at some orchestration opportunities uh, as data is the, is the new oil uh, or, or gold. Um, just, uh, let me see if I uh, I'm not able to. Okay, okay. So um, as mentioned uh, before, where we see uh, uh, increased engagement and use of IoT and cellular connectivity is in predictive uh, uh, maintenance, relying on sensors data and big uh, data analysis. Um, it is uh, it is no longer enough to uh, to assess uh, real time the state of an equipment and, and alert accordingly a, a technician that we see uh, in regular IoT deployment. Uh, but it's not enough. Uh, business service and R&D alike, uh, alike are leveraging big data to provide uh, predictive maintenance to their end customer based on model, uh, direct monitoring of the mechanical condition of the equipment, system efficiency and over indicators to determine the, uh, the actual, uh, actual mean to, to time to failure or loss of efficiency uh, for each, each uh, machine. And uh, according to... Um, to a survey conducted by Ab Aberdeen, um, best-in-class companies are increasingly using predictive maintenance models to improve their operational challenge uh, with uh, interesting uh, uh, results, such as some of the numbers shown, uh, shown below and improving, improving on the uh, operation uh, uh, matrix. Um, if, uh, uh, so on, slide, uh, on this slide, I wanted to, um, to give you a, a bit of a, an example of a customer that uh, that work with uh, with us on this uh, type of application, uh, Veolia is uh, is one of them um, who managed to uh, to propose few a few tiered offering uh, approaches and uh, predictive maintenance offering for their water purification services for hospitals or, or pharma companies. Uh, their their Vision Air portal allows for a comprehensive IoT service platform uh, that lets Veolia offer fully managed services. Uh, contracted for increased efficiency and, uh, and added value uh, and also uh, increase uh, customer uh, satisfaction. Another uh, customer that uh, work with us uh, on, uh, on uh, remote monitoring and predictive maintenance is, uh, is Atlas, uh, Atlas Copco uh, to manage remotely their, their compressors globally and uh, pro propose uh, managed services as well built on IoT and, and cellular technology. Uh, here again, this is not only a, a retrofit uh, solution, but connectivity natively uh, uh, embedded into the compressors uh, coming out of the manufacturing floor. And so provision day one with cellular connectivity. Um, and uh, they are able to provide the insights real time and enable, enable predictive maintenance uh, model. IoT uh, uh, deployment uh, also usually enables another stage to, uh, to those uh, companies. And that's the stage that we mentioned with Matt as well, is the equipment as a, as a service. Uh, taking the example of, uh, of Atlas Copco with uh, better grabs of their equipment and almost real-time connectivity and insight, they can propose new business models to the market and, and differentiate further. For example, transition from pure hardware and one-time equipment sale to an equipment as a service where hardware is subsidized and enable a pair usage model uh, that can work well with uh, asset light uh, company that can uh, more easily accept an OPEX model versus a CAPEX model. Uh, at least uh, it, uh, it provides option to, to, to the OEM. Uh, OEM provide the customer with uh, the required uh, amount of compressed air, a, specif a specified pressure, dupant, and purity, and the package will include the compressed air equipment, ancillaries, installation, full maintenance and repair, spare parts, and annual audits. 
If the customer doesn't want to invest in new equipment or is cash trapped, it simply outsources its compressed air needs to the OEM. So the regular fee is related to only the consumed compressed air. So it's kind of big transformation for, uh, for this, uh, this, uh, this company. However, uh, beyond the connectivity, what we see as well uh, for, uh, for a lot of our uh, OEM customers is, uh, is the problem of, uh, of data-driven transformation. So usually they, have a, uh, they know how to connect their cloud. There's 10 million of, uh, of uh, cloud developers, so they have the choice to be able to connect with APIs there. But they are lacking the, uh, the API at the edge to connect uh, their edge to uh, edge asset to the, to the cloud. Uh, as an example, for to-do list, as we mentioned that, some of the challenges and barriers for, uh, for the customer is uh, usually they get the, uh, the left side of the screen here, the edge, so they have the uh, strong know-how to develop their assets, hardware, uh, and, 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 um, and uh, assets. And then they also have uh, the ability to hire application developer uh, to do their, their, uh, their cloud application and services. Now the issue is, the, the in-between, as, uh, as we saw with the previous uh, speaker. Uh, they have to become uh, almost an IoT infrastructure provider. They have to take care of the cellular connectivity, all the certification and approvals. They have to become expert in uh, protocols and connectivity and subscription management, take care of the OTA updates, firmware over the air, end-to-end security. So it's a big of a undertaking. And, uh, to be honest, often customer would give up uh, maybe a few months into their uh, IoT project or actually realize uh, one year and a half uh, to two years that it's a too complicated undertaking and then uh, they didn't progress uh, as, uh, as much as they, as they wanted. So that's why also uh, another trend that we see uh, as well for OEM are this uh, um, the challenge of, uh, of all the data and all the sensors tied to the to the assets, um, and that's a big, big challenge, how to optimize the, the, the information range, um, and LPWA as well, uh, this low power wide array network, how to, uh, to leverage those, and you need to be able to be uh, pushing intelligence at the edge, being able to orchestrate your data so you don't clog uh, the pipe going from the edge device or, or, or gateway uh, into, the, into the cloud. So that's the next challenge as well. Uh, and there's few options for customers today, either they can do it on, on their own, so they would buy an edge SDK for a, from a supplier, the, provide a dev, uh, an IoT platform, find their connectivity provider and device maker. It's, it's a big, big, big undertaking, especially on the life of the, of the solution, right? So they have to maintain that over a few years. Um, what about also another solution as well is a stovepipe vertical solution. But that also has drawbacks. I mean, you are tied to a, a vendor uh, and you are also uh, lacking the, uh, the ownership of the data. And we've seen that data is a new gold, is the new uh, currency. And by uh, relying on stuff by vertical solution, you are kind of locked into uh, to a vendor and you cannot do your big data analysis that you, uh, that you, that you want. So not very elegant uh, uh, option. So that's why also, another, another barrier for, for adoption and another challenge we didn't touch on is the uh, uh, pricing uh, um, and the fact that it's uh, often an unknown, especially as customers want to start uh, their deployment. They don't know exactly their ROI. And the way it is done today, it's not uh, easy for them to get uh, a good grasp. It's not predictable. Uh, they don't know what's security overhead. Uh, they have to uh, negotiate contract uh, with uh, many carrier if they are not using a single uh, MVNO like, uh, like uh, Clark mentioned uh, Sierra Wallace. So it's not, uh, it's not predictable and they have a hard time defining the right ROI day one and usually can be a barrier for, for adoption. Um, so that's why I think uh, Sierra can, can help as well in addition to what uh, Clark mentioned, bringing the portfolio of product. We are also trying to tie all those things together. We want the customer to focus on their application, not the infrastructure. And we want platform to be able to manage cloud uh, stream of data, but also uh, data coming into the, uh, at, the, at, at the edge. Uh, and then also having a fully scalable uh, solution. Uh, for that, we have uh, launched the Octave orchestrating, uh, distributing orchestrating platform, basically allowing 
uh, a combination of hardware tied to your asset where we can push uh, a compressing at the edge. Uh, so basically you can do a lot of the uh, uh, data processing at the edge before sending to the cloud, do some computation there, correlation, filtering. And then once in the a, in a cloud, you can also integrate to over third party services and ultimately push those uh, data into a system of record like AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, etc. And we also take care, as uh, Clark mentioned, of all the device management, end-to-end -end security, and uh, also embedded connectivity. So they come day one with connectivity, so you don't have to uh, worry about that. So more or less, we take all the complexity between the getting your data from the device to the cloud, we take that out of the equation so you can focus on your data, your big data analytics, and uh, creating the best uh, edge device. And again, we have also some, uh, some ways to uh, simplify the business model. So uh, no longer you have to uh, you know, worry about overage or global pricing. So now we go with one device uh, hardware. You, have, you pay for what message and data points you are sending to the cloud, a bit like the model that you see in, uh, in cloud when you integrate with an AWS or Azure. Now you are also uh, paying for data points you are sending from the device to the, to the cloud. So it's very fully uh, controllable and predictable. So day one, you know the ROI uh, going into your IoT, IoT project. Um, and so for final uh, thoughts, so I would say focus on the insights uh, the data bring to your business as you embark into, uh, into your IoT project. You want to rely on partners to get those data points from A to B to C. Uh, don't try to do everything on, on your own. Uh, you want to also optimize the data sent between the device and the cloud to lower your uh, TCO. Uh, meaning you have to push more intelligence at the edge as much as possible. And then, of course, uh, the security piece is always coming back to, uh, to us. So you need to have a reliable partner that can provide security at the device level, at the network level, and at the cloud level. So don't be shy uh, about doing audit, which uh, we get that uh, all the time. And on that uh, note, I will uh, give that uh, uh, to, uh, to Patrick. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Remy. Um, uh, yeah, so that was uh, very insightful content on, on your, your new business models and, and pricing innovation. Um, okay, so now I, I'd like to invite back all the speakers to address some of the questions from the audience. We've, we've probably run a little bit um, over on the presentation, so we'll have to limit the, the number of questions. So. Um, so guys, uh, let's see if everybody can join. Um, great, okay. So yeah, so the, the first question is actually for, for you, Remy, while, you, while you're still on the line. So the um, question came in is, so in your opinion, what, what is an edge device? Are you talking about a sensor, a, a full piece of equipment, or, or a gateway, so I or something say, uh, different? Um, yeah, it can be a, a, a gateway, so we connect to an asset, uh, let's say, for example, your compressor, we connect with a serial interface, and then we take care of the connectivity within the, the gateway, a cellular connectivity, so it can be tied to a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi locally. I would say also it can be uh, an edge device, could be a module uh, that is uh, embedded onto the controller of the machine uh, that we solder on the PCB, for example. So that could be the edge device as well that we can uh, help control with uh, all the tools that Sierra Wireless provide. So either a gateway or a cellular modem, for example, uh, uh, soldered down on the machine itself natively. Okay. Um, and in, in terms of, of that kind of uh, IoT and connectivity over cellular for industrial environments, what, what are the limiting factors that, that could uh, be there for response speed and response time? Well, I think the... Uh, the LTE network provide actually that latency that uh, was missing in the past. Uh, so uh, first also uh, providing a better bandwidth uh, and in-building penetration so you can get to the, to the uh, assets inside the, the building and that's LTEM and BIoT are providing that. And then the latency is a, is a millisecond uh, latency leveraging the LTE, LTE network. And you can also reach the devices with uh, a private, uh, uh, you know, with a private AP uh, and private APN, so we can 
you know, send command to the device uh, and, uh, and get the latency there. So, uh, so yeah, I think there is much more improvement on latency based on this new technology like LTEM coming into the market. Okay, great, thanks. Um, one, another question for, for Clark. Um, so in terms of having a, a global business, how, how, how would they ensure the, that they have strong connectivity globally um, for uh, cellular industrial IoT deployments? Well, it, it's, it's critical in the design of the device um, that they're gonna be using or, or, or choosing off the shelf. It's going to be important that it, it that the bands uh, that are supported within the uh, within the module of that device are support the actual carriers that are available in the markets where they want to deploy that device. The other piece is obviously to have a solution where you can have a, a single SIM that's going to allow you to really take advantage of the uh, carriers in any market that you're going to be going into it really simplifies your your deployment because you have a single SKU you have one one part that you can actually put into the device and then deploy anywhere and be able to to light it up when it arrives in that particular market okay great great thanks for that um, and one one for you Matt uh, a quick one because I know we're, we're running out of time so um, what, what protocols are typically used for sending industrial data over, over cellular connections? So uh, there isn't one that's necessarily typical, but what seems to be popular right now is the MQTT protocol for publishing and subscribing in uh, low um, bandwidth areas. So the, that's the protocol that's used. The real problem is trying to develop a standardized data structure so if your data looks um, one way at the edge and your application expects it to look a different way in the cloud um, trying to square those two uh, data payloads is what's emerging as the big challenge now for people so that the um, data coming from the edge device seamlessly goes into the application right now there's a lot of uh, middleware that needs to happen in between the data being published and the application itself in order for the data to be structured correctly. But um, MQTT, HTTP, those are the two main protocols for getting data up. And then the data is in JSON, just the structure of it is um, the issue these days. Okay, great. Um, I think we want time for one final question for Eugenio, um, which came in. Um, that's what are the main benefits 5G will bring in industrial settings? Yeah. Uh, well, the first one that comes to mind is uh, flexibility. Flexibility in the sense that uh, 5G will provide a wireless alternative to wide systems that are used today. And this will make the factory floor much more uh, adaptable. So right now we have many um, uh, solutions that are using wired networks because of the low latency, because of the high reliability, but these are static solutions. So it's hard to reconfigure or to alterate uh, the production line if it is required. With 5G, this would be possible. So I'd say this is the main benefit of 5G. Okay, great. Thanks, Eugenia. Um, okay, well, un unfortunately, uh, that, that's all we've got time for today. Um, some, some really great presentations and so, some great discussions and some really good questions came in. So once again, I'd, I'd like to thank all, all the speakers for participating and especially all the attendees for, for joining and listening in and providing questions and being part of this webinar. Um, please note, we will make a recording of the webinar and make it available in the coming days. Um, so if, uh, because you've registered, you will, you will receive that um, when we, we do some small editing. So yeah, so, uh, so, so thanks for, for joining. I look, I look forward to speaking, you, speaking to you again. Um, so look out for our, our upcoming webinars and uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation today. So that's, that's all from us. Thanks and goodbye. Have a, have a great day. Thank you.